Good afternoon, everybody. This is Arthur Severio coming to you live from Severio Gallery on Charter Street in the French Quarter, presenting to you Miss Bethany Baltman, who's in charge of the Musicians Clinic and who's had a long line of knowing famous photographers, and Miss Penny Weaver, who has photographed probably one of the most famous photographers. Cartier Brisson. So I don't know which one of you ladies want to start first. We'll just kind of get it going and see what happens. Well, B comes before P. Okay. <laughs> well, I never anticipated being the um, subject of photographers. Uh, the very first photographer who I met, who was who took a picture, was Diana Michener. And she took a snapshot of my husband and me, which she put on her refrigerator in New York. And Eve Arnold saw the photograph and said, oh, who's that? And Diana said, oh, well, that's my friend in New Orleans. That's Bethany. And she said, oh, she looks like the American Madonna to me. Now, <laughs> I really didn't see it. So when Eve Arnold called up and said, I want to come from New York. I want to take a photograph of you. I was like, Eve, look. That's really sweet, but I've got two little kids. I work three jobs. I'm a writer. I'm trying to finish a book. I really, honestly do not have time to be photographed by you. I'm sure there's another woman in America that <laughs> you could fit the bill. And you really, I'm sure, could find somebody in New York. Bye. Well, a week later, Hi, it's Eve Arnold. I'm in New Orleans. When can I come over? And I thought, well, I thought I made myself really clear. I said, look, okay, I'm feeding my kids and bathing them at five o'clock. If you'd like to come over because I need to get back to work. So if you want to come over at five and watch me feed my children and whatever, I will, you know, that's fine. And so I was reading them a story and Eve was walking around taking pictures, taking pictures, taking pictures. And I totally forgot about it. And she left. And a year later, Eve Arnold called up and said, you are the American Madonna. You're in, gonna be in my book in America. I'm sending you the release. And you know, you're gonna be in corporate collections, lucky you. So, that is how I got to be the American Madonna. And she never gave me a press, and she never <laughs> gave me a book. And she never gave me a No! And then she, she walked. Now, Eve, Eve died, I think she was almost 100 when she died, but she and I, um, she, I think she sort of thought that it was, the whole experience was really annoying to me. And um, so I had mentioned to her somewhere in, in seeing her in New York a couple of times that I really wanted to go to India and do a story about the royal families in India that had become uh, po politicians. And I don't particularly remember mentioning that to her, but one day she called up and said, I got us an assignment for the London Times and we're going to India and we have a three month assignment. So I got to spend three months solidly with Eve Arnold. Wow. And she still never gave me a print. Oh, yeah. <laughs> print would have been okay. I know. <laughs> but that sounds pretty good too. <laughs> yeah. So, now you can tell your okay. point of Well, my, my claim to fame in Arthur's mind is that I was fortunate enough to cross paths with uh, the great uh, photographer of the 20th century, uh, Andre Cartier Bresson, who uh, was known, he's known for the, capturing the decisive moment. He um, was a photo, like a, he was an art photographer, but he didn't see it himself that way. He he was had assignments all over the world. He documented things, and he happened to come to uh, Greenville, Mississippi, in 1970 to make a video. CBS uh, had hired him to be the 
filmmaker for some kind of series it was doing. This was going to be a film on the Mississippi Delta. And at that time, in 1970, I was a club reporter, which means brand new, novice, just getting started, for the local paper, which was the Delta Democrat Times. And I, I heard that the Cartier Bresson was coming, and so I saw him one day come into the newsroom, and he was a very handsome to me, even though he's much older. He was very, he was very elegant. He was just elegant. Um, and I saw him in the newsroom, and I didn't say anything. And then about two days, a couple of days later, Mount Greenville was on the river, on the, on a, a, the Mississippi River, a lake that feeds into the river. And there's a levee, a big levee. It's a public place. Uh, the downtown ends there. There's a marina. And on a Sunday afternoon, it was gray and cloudy. Uh, I was down there for whatever reason uh, and had one of the newspaper's cameras. I didn't have my own camera. They were, I had cameras that reporters could check out and use to take pictures for their stories. It was a twin lens camera, either a Yushika mat or a Rolleiflex. I don't remember which one. And I had it and I saw him come over the levee because his hotel was literally on the other side of the levee. And he was by himself and there was a commotion because a car had rolled into the water. Nobody was in it, it was just a loose car. <laughs> But people were watching it get, you know, all the people working to pull it out. And I went up to him and, you know, like, uh, it said I, who I was and that I'd seen him in our newsroom and I had my camera around. I said, Can't, may I take your picture? And he said, well, not for, I don't want it in the, pub, not for publication. I don't want it. And I said, okay, sure. So I took two snaps. And I could tell, even though he granted me permission, that he just really didn't like it, me taking those, I mean, it's like he just wasn't comfortable. And I left him, and that was it. And, um, you know, at some point later, I, I was learning how to do photography, and, and I, I made a picture, an enlargement, and I, for me, and I had it, and I displayed it on my wall, you know, with whatever. And so years go by, that was 1970, and in 2001, I think it was. Wow, 30 years. Um, I had occasion to, oh, the New York Times did a big story about Bresson setting up a foundation in Paris that he was gonna donate all of his archives. They were gonna be the holder of his legacy. And it was a big story. It was like, and it was at the same time in Paris, a show, a retrospective huge of his work. So I saw that and I thought, well, I'm gonna pull out that picture and I'm gonna write Mr. Bre Cartier Bresson a letter and have a little print made and send him that. So as I did and I outlined, you know, I told him very straightforward what had happened. Uh, here's the picture and I, it was a nice letter if I say so myself. <laughs> and uh, I sent it off to him. And I, it wasn't two weeks later, I promise it wasn't two weeks later, I get a handwritten thank you note from him. It was written on the back of a postcard. Uh, it was one of his images on the postcard. And um, thanking me, and you know, he, signed, he was up in years, he was in his 90s then. I think he died a couple of years later. And I, he had had his wife or somebody put it in an envelope and mail it. And it's like I was just stunned that he would take the time to write. I mean, it didn't take him just a short note, but it just, it, it just, it was very fulfilling. Absolutely. And anyway, that was kind of like, you know, being a big fan, it's like I felt like it was sort of the highlight of my life. Yes. I yes. taken the picture yes. and then they <laughs> reached out and he had just been, it just, you know, there, he clearly was a man of great character that he would uh, you know, take the time. It's like, you know, you're Eve Arnold, you, you know, you graciously let her take it, but she, I mean, the very thing that she didn't even give you a print. No, that was I mean, I just couldn't, that's just beyond, but anyway. I'll tell you an Eve Arnold story that when I got to spend three months with her in India, um, you know, I. I was just like, Eve, I love your pictures 
of Malcolm X. I mean, they were amazing. How did you get Malcolm X to let you be probably one of the few white photographers that he allowed to take his picture? And she said, well, you know, I don't really pay attention to what anybody's saying. And I'm little, and I was like, yeah, I noticed you are very little. And so she was at the speech that he gave, I believe it was in Harlem, where the first time he said, we have to kill Whitey, we have to kill Whitey. And so uh, all of the male tall photographers who were in the front left. And she'd been working her way up, working her way up, working her way up, and suddenly, she had a clear path and she got right underneath of him and he wasn't even on a very high stage and she just got right under him and just started taking pictures and he stopped and he laid down and he said who are you like you know what like, what's going on with you and she said look you really need to go back to that talk you don't need to be distracted because i can't take your picture when you're talking to me <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, I don't know who you are, but you know, anytime you just, you tell my guys and you're perfectly welcome, but she had no idea what he said. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I literally uh, just ordered and I've gotten it. Uh, it's uh, Aperture has like a sale, a small print sale, and you can buy it for, you know, they have, and I bought an Eve Arnold picture of Malcolm X. Oh, that's so funny! I, I got it. Wow. I just got it like two weeks ago. I'm, it's a Christmas present for a friend of mine in, in Montgomery. I cannot I, believe I, that. It's, it's so funny. It's, that... it's a pose. It's like I think this was a pose picture because he's like turns. It's a profile. It's just he's looking really sharp. Mm -hmm. But I just can't believe all this coincidence. I know it's 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 really funny. The small world category, which is why. When I met the wonderful um, Herman Leonard at the Ken Burns Jazz Book Party, um, and he, the first time he met me, he said, "I'd really like to take your photograph." And I thought, "Not again! No, no, no! You know, like I want to be your best friend. I think you're super cool. Mm -hmm. I love his pictures, particularly of Billy Holiday." But no, I mean, like, why would you want to take a picture of me? You photograph Louis Armstrong. You photograph Billy Holiday. I mean, like, you don't want to photograph me. So I, I really liked him and went out to dinner with him a couple of times. And so about two years later, we're at this party after Jazz Fest, no makeup on, been out in the sun, and I'm eating crawfish. <laughs> I'm at a table eating crawfish. <laughs> And Herman Leonard comes and sits right over there. And I'm just busy eating crawfish. And he said, you know, I have to say that in all my years as a photographer, I've never had anybody be so dismissive of me Ooh. as you have been. And I find it honestly pretty offensive. <laughs> <laughs> and the person next to me, who I wasn't paying attention to because I was eating crawfish, says, oh my God, Mr. Leonard, I am so honored. I had no idea that you wanted to photograph me. And I, I'm sure that it was my agent or somebody. And if I'd known, I would change my schedule to be here. Unfortunately, I'll leave tomorrow, but I'll come back. To which Herman Leonard replied to the person next to me. I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to her. And so the shocked face of Liv Tyler stares at me like, you got to photograph her and not me. I mean, the look that she gave me said it all. And I said, believe me, you're probably the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I don't get it either. I really don't <laughs> get what he sees. But when those photographs were made, I see what he saw. Yeah. I don't yeah. see myself like that, but that's what he saw. And that's why he was a genius, because 
I could have been a bottle of pears. I mean, it wasn't about me. It was about his vision of what he wanted. And he, he took the photographs and then he probably spent more time in the dark room creating the light because that garden room is a very, very hard room to photograph in, even in black and white, because the light is so difficult. And yeah. he had this picture of what he wanted, how he wanted me dressed, and in the garden room. I mean, that he had that vision, and he had pursued it for three years, and I just kept brushing him off because I thought, why would you want to do that? Yeah, that's very sad. It's in um, my house in the Garden District that I've abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> for the <Yes>. French Quarter. <laughs> for for yes. that. Yes. Mentioning the dark room and his care and effort in there will kind of bring me back to this this particular imprint. This is this is my shot of uh, Henri Cartier Bresson, uh, and this uh, Bresson did not like to do dark room. He took the pictures, but he didn't print. I mean, it, that just, he had no interest in that. But you remember he's French and he's based in Paris and he was fortunate enough to connect up with probably the greatest printer. That's all he did was print. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Boyan Mitrovic. He's still alive. Uh, he's retired. He doesn't print anymore. But for 30 years from the 60s through 97 or so, he was the primary printer of not only Cartier Bresson but other world name photographers like Cadell, Cadell, what's his name? I have it. I have a little thing on here. Uh, but I, it's it's a lot. It's too long a story. I don't want to bore everybody. But I had the good fortune through, you know, everything in life is kind of connections and who you know, how you know, you meet people and whatever. And I was fortunate enough to make a connection that I was able to send my negative of Bresson, the little cheap film, whatever it was the newspaper was letting us use, to Voya Metropic, who, as a favor to another photographer friend who set this up, uh, made me, made that print. Oh. And that was uh, in, when did I say I did it? Uh, 2014, it was just three years ago. I had, um, he sent me three images, three exact same prints, and that's one of them. I gave one to the person who set this up for me, and then the third one I donated to the Brace Home Foundation. Oh, uh, but if anybody is seriously interested in photography, uh, on this little handout I have that, um, that has a brief description of these other people that I have been lucky enough to have photographed, these are like, I consider, except for one snapshots. There is a, you know, it's because it's printed on paper, you have to type it in, but there's an online photography magazine called The Online Photographer. And uh, it's a long piece on Metrovic. That's, if you have any interest in exploring who he is and why he's so great, I highly recommend you read it. Oh, now, okay, Arthur. Uh, uh, I, 1970 was, long, I was, like I said, just beginning. I was, I was, I've never fancied myself a photographer, but I like to take pictures. And doing that at the newspaper kind of really sparked the interest in, um, and years after that, I always like had camera and liked to take pictures and uh, was fortunate through the years to have bumped into some other kind of famous people through. Again, it's like, just connections, not because of any particular skill or anything I ever did, but I, I in connection with Arthur's Salon, uh, have brought these prints of other famous people that I happen to have photographed, and the only one of which that is I consider that I actually made an appointment and wanted to photograph myself because I personally considered him a hero is. Uh, this is Judge Frank Menace Johnson, Jr. He was a federal judge in Alabama in the 60s. He said, well, he's totally retired, but he was appointed in the, uh, well, like 1959. And he was the ju federal judge who uh, made significant rulings in many of Alabama's most important civil rights cases. Um, 
including allowing this settlement to Montgomery March to proceed. And I just had, when I moved to Alabama in 1973, I kind of learned about him. I didn't, didn't know him and it was like I had a crush on him and I wanted to, you know. So a, a reporter friend of mine who covered courts uh, asked if I could come have an audit, you know, come take pictures. And he let me come into his office and I took three rolls of 22 exposure. I didn't have 36 exposure, 22. I was a black and white film. And uh, there's some other good prints, but this is the one that was kind of like the sort of, the one I ended up framing and taking to him and asking him to autograph it to me and other people. And, and then this is just another shot from that day. But the other pictures of famous, or some of these people may not be famous to you, but they are kind of well known. This is Julian Bond, who most people know. This was kind of an act though. I didn't even list him on that program because this was in 1974 in my dining room in my house in Montgomery. And it's a long story, but that's when I first met him and I took a couple of snaps of him. And as it turns out, I really have liked this picture over the years. He's again, he's a very uh, beautiful, elegant person. And I guess in around in the late 80s, 1990, uh, I guess I didn't, I stopped thinking of him as being a famous person because he became a very close friend because he married my bet, one of my best friends. And we spent a lot of time together. And I have lots of snapshots from those later years, but this is the one that um, when I didn't really know him, I just snapped his picture. And the other famous person, of course, is Rosa Parks, the lady on the right and on the left up there. And the reason I, and the woman with her is also famous if you study civil rights or Alabama history, her name is Virginia Durr. And I was friends with Virginia, and that's how I got to be hanging out a little bit with Rosa Parks. And this is an artist who everybody had access to him. He just walked to his door, people, everybody could walk in. And he, he only got like famous in the art world later in years, before he died actually. His name is Mose Tolliver. He was called Mose T. And he would sit on his bed with house paint and paint these pictures and people could walk in and, you know, give him $25 or whatever. Uh, but his work hangs in, you know, like the Smithsonian. He's, he, the Ogden Museum has his work. And this is the most recent image I took. This was taken in 2010. And that's Nell Harper Lee, who uh, in her last years didn't actually give audience to visitors, much less photographers. But through, again, connections here you know, because I have a friend who was a good friend of hers he invited me to go down to see her and she was in an assisted living home in uh, Monroeville and I had my camera and I took a bunch of snapshots all throughout our visit she never said anything about it you know didn't say don't take my picture <laughs> so I did and this one was I liked because she had this kind of kind, nice smile. And she's wearing her sister Alice's t-shirt. It says Alabama State Bar. Her sister, older sister Alice was a lawyer who kind of looked after her. Anyway, that's all my stories. Right there on the corner. Who? The camera on the corner. Oh yeah, here. Oh yeah, this one I just happened to come across. Again, he's probably, he's he would be famous only to people who, uh, follow blues musicians. His name is James Ford Thomas, or Son Thomas. And he also, though, was equally uh, in the world of self-taught art or whatever. He was a sculptor. And he, uh, with his profession, he was a grave digger. And he was very poor. And Penelope, my daughter, who is here, um, she, this picture was made when Penelope and her friends uh, hired him to play at one of Penelope's friends' birthday parties. Penelope, I think, was like 19 at the time. Yeah, I was. It was a pool pool party in Greenville, and she 
they went to Leland and picked him up and he came and played the guitar and sang. Uh, and I just thought he had a beautiful, wonderful face. He was always seemed like sad, you know, maybe that's what blues musicians are. But I, I only later came to know that he was equally known for his, these, especially these skull sculptures and he would use like real human teeth in them. But they, he, in the world of art, he's, he is acknowledged as somebody worth collecting. So anyway, that's my story. Wonderful. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Before we go, I would like for you to talk about what you do now. Please. Well, and a little I, bit about okay. stuff too. So I'll tell you a little bit about my life with how I um, got to know Fats Domino. Um, in my career, I was a photo stylist and got these wonderful assignments to do album covers and work for magazines in New York, whatever. So I got this assignment with Cindy Bird, a wonderful local photographer, to go and photograph Fats Domino's Christmas album cover in the middle of August in 1992. So we had to play Christmas music to inspire us. Now to find Christmas decorations in New Orleans in August is in itself really daunting. Then Fats had to dress up as if it were Christmas and walk around his house for three days while Cindy took photographs. Now Fats uh, is, was a fantastic cook and he made this hogshead cheese that was so spicy that I just think about it and my palms start sweating. And, and I mean, it was just like, it was so spicy. And of course, if he didn't eat his hogshead cheese, he wasn't gonna sit there for hours and let you take his picture. So finally he pulled out some homemade strawberry wine that was like something you give hummingbirds. And so <laughs> in the three days when I see this picture, I think about that spicy hogshead cheese and the hummingbird food. But anyway, so we took photographs and took photographs and it was really, really hot. And Cindy uh, Bird said on the last day, let me just take a snapshot of you and Fats. Now, that sofa was fantastic on the actual album because in the armrest, he had his telephone. And when the phone rang, the brake lights on that Cadillac <laughs> sofa came on. That was very, very cool. And then that dog was Cindy's dog, and she just insisted that for the Christmas album, we had to have you know a white fluffy dog with the Santa hat on. Finding the Santa hat was probably the most difficult thing that I had to do on that whole photo shoot. And so that was the last, the last day, last picture of Fats. But today, I run the New Orleans Musicians Clinic and Assistance Foundation, and we do health care and social services for 2,500 performers in New Orleans. And with what's going on in healthcare, I should be doing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just trying to keep things on track for the performers who give their lives in New Orleans. And it's it's getting rougher than it was before Katrina, in my opinion. So any questions? Yep. That was fascinating, Bethany. I love that story. How about the mask? What are the masks about? Oh, that was when I was queen of Cray de Boo, and a lot of the, of the people who worked for the Musicians <coughs> Clinic created masks of my face, and they carried those, and then all the men who were involved with us wore Bobby Jindal mask and dressed like the Grim Reaper to accompany them. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that, uh, Kruger? Then? 
I think it, I was queen in 2013. It's a lot of fun. When I was seven years old growing up in Mississippi, my parents brought me to D.H. Holmes to sit on Santa's lap. And Santa asked me what I wanted and I said, I want to be queen of the French Quarter. And Santa looked kind of amazed, like, little girl, that's kind of not what my job is. And so when I was queen of Cordova, as I was coming through the quarter, I thought, thank you, Santa. It took a while. So where in Mississippi did you grow up? Natchez. Oh, Natchez. And it was just such an accident. I mean, I should have been born here. I really wanted to be oh, born the here. It's the river connection. I know, but it, it's not here. No, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're here now. But I'm here yeah. now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I love being in this particular block. It's, yeah. I feel very, very it's lucky. Yes, yeah. So no questions? Well, but what's talk a little more about the New Orleans, the musicians, the systems. When you said it, you think that the uh, healthcare situation is. I know it was created, wasn't it, after Katrina to help music? No, we we were founded in 1998. Oh. And we were founded because of a fish concert. If anybody likes fish, mm -hmm. um, they performed at Jazz Fest, and they brought out a special guest, and it was the keyboard of Fish's father, and he had created Volunteers of Medicine. And he was a real visionary as a doctor from South Carolina. And he, while he was standing on the stage singing the one song he knows, he only knows one, but he's really good at that song. Won't you come home, Bill, won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Playing that with fish, looking at it, all the hundreds of thousands of fish fans. And he thought, you know, this is a birthplace of American music, but it's an early grave for every single person who performs here. And so he went back to Hilton Head, South Carolina, and he thought, you know, there's got to be a healthcare system in New Orleans that's going to keep these tragic outcomes from happening. And so uh, it took him a year. He was at a cocktail party one night, one summer night, and he ran into Sybil Moriel, and it was when her son was mayor. And he went up and said, hi, I'm Jack McConnell. And I invented the commercial MRI, and I created encapsulated Tylenol, and I want to save the musicians of New Orleans. And so she thought that was kind of a compelling argument, and she said, come down to New Orleans, and she introduced him to my husband, who was at the time the chairman of the Board of Jazz and Heritage Foundation, and on the board of LSU Medical School, and my husband drugged me along as the cultural anthropologist who was constantly complaining about the misery and the racial inequality of the city. I'm like, oh, she should be involved too. And um, we put together a group of doctors and people from the community and we just on a wing and a prayer very naively decided that we would create this healthcare system embedded within the LSU Medical School. And um, so that's how we started. And we were kind of naive because we believed that this little brick and mortar clinic giving access to healthcare was gonna change the world. And um, as we have evolved, we're about to be 20 years old, we realized that we have to work in housing inequality, we have to work in healthcare outcomes, we have to work in prevention, we have to work in more and more access because we are lucky now that we have Medicaid in Louisiana, but there's so few doctors who take Medicaid. And the thing I've been working on today, and when I leave here, I'll go back and work on it again. There are only 65 psychiatrists in all of New Orleans. And over half of them don't take Medicaid. So access to people who really need it, the creative community is just, it's really difficult. So we're trying to find new systems all the time. So on that happy note. <laughs> Final words, anybody? Mm. Ladies? No? Nope.
Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.